Thank you, Martha. I see my first slide is up. I'm going to leave it there for a little while as I give a little introduction. Um, the website at the bottom, if you want to copy that down, uh, is the site uh, at Sandia that describes all of the work that's going on by the contractors at this point in time. Uh, the other is the DOE uh, portal for PV. Uh, if you just get into that or Google Sieges, uh, you'll get more information than you really want. Um, the Sieges project uh, began in 2007. And from there, I'm going to see if I can move forward here. And I want to acknowledge that uh, we had a great team. This is just the Sandia team. I cannot really list all of the team members of the contractors and the subcontractors, uh, but I do want to say we had a, a, broad, a broad range of expertise. Uh, we were collaborating with the contractors back and forth uh, wherever there was an area where the labs had expertise that they needed. Uh, we jumped in there and worked with them. Uh, we didn't tell them how to do the project, but uh, when they needed help, uh, they jumped up and said, let's take a look at these things, and we did uh, uh, provide help. Uh, the Siege Project, uh, like I said, began in 2007. Um, it began, it was really the first solar energy technology program step towards uh, making PV more intelligent. Systems that are installed today are still pretty dumb. Uh, they produce power when the sun shines. Whether or not the utility can accept all that power, whether or not there's voltage regulation problems, and so forth. So we needed more intelligence in PV. I like to call it value added for both the owner and for the utilities. Uh, this makes PV a lot more friendly for the utilities that have to do the interconnecting. Uh, the Sieges box in the middle here is basically the heart of the system. It couples to uh, communications, resource information, couples to uh, utility data centers, what the utility needs and so forth. There is a heck of a lot of communications that goes into Sieges. And that is basically the key to getting more intelligent interconnections to the grid. Uh, Sieges also worked with controlled loads, uh, microgrids, energy storage, energy management, uh, residential and commercial was our focus. Uh, we had limited money. It takes a lot more money to produce and develop things for very large scales. So we did what we could with commercial and residential sizes. They are adaptable and expandable on into utility scale. So when we started in the beginning, <laughs> And I want to say also what I'm going to talk to you today about is the top part of an iceberg. Okay, just imagine it's only 10% of all of the details that everybody went to to make sure that the communications works, the new technology and the inverters work, uh, all of the interfaces that need to be there on both the DC and the AC side are all underwater. I'm only going to talk about what we can see, the top tip of the iceberg. But if you look at this little Sieges icebreaker here, this is what we saw in 2007. There were all kinds of barriers. And believe it or not, we've only melted down a couple of these. They're still there. Uh, you know, standards and codes are really a big issue. Utility acceptance is it's coming around really is coming around now. And in some cases, they're forced to do it, but they're beginning to accept photovoltaics as a power source, not a negative load. And a negative load is bad because <laughs> uh, the utility was built to produce power at a central station, move it to the loads. All of a sudden, we've got photovoltaics out here at the loads pumping power back towards that central station. Some of the protection relays, some of the voltage regulation devices don't work well in that reverse direction. So now I want to get interactive. How many people in here know what an island is? Three, four, okay. How many people know what a smart grid is? About the same. Well, we're all in the same boat. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, we still don't know what a smart grid is, but we're talking about coupling to the smart grid of the future. Um, you know, the grid tied uh, communications protocol, protocols, they're being developed in international standards. Some in the U.S., we have our IEEE 1547 standard that's got some uh, communication protocol and communications type of uh, requirements coming along. Um, so I'm not going to stay on this very long. Uh, I do want to say that reliability uh, was a very important part of CGIS. We started in 2007, 2008 with uh, some reliability problems. CGIS wanted to see improved reliability along with all these new functionalities. And the functionalities were basically something that came out of some workshops that we conducted with the Department of Energy. And there was also a renewable systems integration paper that you can get also on the DOE website that talks about everything that needed to be done or what people thought needed to be done in 2009 to make good grid interconnection for photovoltaics and other distributed generations. <clears throat> so the vision of sieges we wanted to enable highly integrated, innovative, advanced inverters, uh, controllers, balance of systems, the critical balance of system concepts, and energy management. And, and like I said, we focused on residential and commercial PV applications. I think a lot of people have seen these charts over here. It's very obvious that uh, the module costs had to come down. And so did inverters and balance system costs come down. We did work on that with the Sieges program. We wanted to significantly advance inverters. Back in 2007, there were a lot of inverters out there. Like I said, there was very, very little communications. There was a little bit of data acquisition. There was, some re, uh, there was some programming that somebody had to go out to the site and change things so that the inverter would work for the particular site. But we wanted to see revolutionary changes, not evolutionary changes. So we wanted high value residential commercial applications between 100 watts and 250 kilowatts. The systems used advanced energy management. That included building energy management systems. One of the contractors has that built into the inverter they developed for Sieges. It's a nice way to get more value out of your complete system. It, uh, you know, conservation is the biggest bang for the buck still. So if you can combine conservation along with your renewable energy generation, you've got a more valuable site. Um, <clears throat> What we did not include in the CGIS program was development of PV cells, modules, or the energy storage technology. The timetable, if you look at it, we are out here. CGIS is winding down. Uh, all of the work will basically be con uh, done at the end of September. We do have a conference in October at Solar Power International. It's a one day session. It's a CGIS session combined with standards and codes, and, stand, and also a new CGIS program out of DOE, which is CGIS AC, Advanced Concepts. Uh, stage one, concept and feasibility. We started with 26 contractors. <coughs> we weeded them out to about 12. It was difficult. We had you know, limited funding again. Hold on. allergy season. But we wanted to see uh, basically really good concepts. And along with those concepts that were presented, we wanted to see whether or not there was a market. So there was a market analysis. In stage two was prototyping. Uh, a lot of testing and prototyping from the circuit board level all the way up through a systems type of, of tests. Stage three is toward commercialization. Uh, it's an important part of Sieges. We wanted to see commercialized product by the end of the third year. 
we do have those products and they will be demonstrated in September this year. There's four conferences and uh, the invites are going out in the next week or so. <clears throat> okay. Like I said, systems that have gone in in the past maybe are still going in. There's a lot of dumb systems, but we want to see smarter systems. Uh, we want to see the PV array connected to possibly optimized energy storage, not the biggest thing you can buy, but something that's needed to get the utility through just a rough period of time. It might be seconds or minutes. <clears throat> Um, adaptive logic, uh, kind of think ahead what's happened the day before, uh, maybe measure the weather, things of that sort, so that you know what's coming, so that you can get spinning reserve up and going, uh, and then energy management to combine with that adaptive logic. There are internet connections, there's all kinds of communications taking place. Um, all of our contractors looked at communications, there is not one single method that you can use in a smart grid connection at this point in time. It's gonna take a combination of communication systems working together. Some of the important advances, we were looking for systems integrations. We weren't looking for parts to put together in the field. We wanted something that could be um, designed in the factory, installed, and put together in the factory as much as possible and then taken out to the field, uh, just as Aminex found. If you do factory assembly, it's a lot more efficient than out there in the field where parts can get lost and broken and mistakes are made. Uh, smart string combiners, where you take this, each string and take a look at what that string is doing. You can perform your max power point tracking on that string. Then you can combine that into a DC bus that DC bus can be uh, something that can be used for other types of generations, not just photovoltaics. Energy storage is DC. You can also use fuel cells. You can do uh, many types of uh, other distributed generation on that DC bus. Uh, another area, maximum power point tracking. Uh, one contractor has seen in the past and that uh, the different kinds of technology needs a little bit different kind of max power point tracker. Uh, some of the thin film devices have a pretty flat power curve. Uh, it takes a little better power tracker for the concentrator systems. When you get a little bit of cloud passage, you need, maybe need something that's a little faster than what we have today. So a new max power point tracker has been developed and you'll be seeing that in the very near future in some products. Um, low voltage ride through. Uh, when the utility has troubles, the voltage goes down. When the voltage goes down, today the PV system is required to turn off. In some instances, the utility really needs help at that time. It doesn't need for its generation to get offline. So a low voltage ride through function is something that has been developed now. It can be commanded by the utility. It might be an autonomous thing. For instance, on, on the island of Hawaii, uh, they may have lower voltages that are allowed than on, on mainland US. Um, <clears throat> resource performance predictions, uh, satellite types of communications, satellite pictures can do some pretty good things for predicting what your resource is going to do so that if you do have spinning reserve uh, that needs to be cranked up, ready to go, you see a bank of clouds coming, things of that sort, that resource prediction can be very useful. Uh, the intermittency, you've heard people talk about intermittency because of cloud passages. Um, that intermittency can cause uh, voltage regulation issues on the utility grid and it can also cause some problems with the protection equipment. So that intermittency mitigation uh, can be handled in several ways. Uh, one of those, of course, is to have a little bit of storage, ramp your voltage down, ramp your input down a little bit so that it's not a, an abrupt one and a half second change from 100% output to 20% output. <clears throat> it's, um, 
It's been developed for all of our Aegis contractors. Um, and there's also another method that can be used, and that is uh, volt ampere reactive support. And when you talk about volt ampere reactive, it's not real power, it's imaginary power. It's circulating current, but it's the kind of current that's needed to make motors work and so forth. So when you hear people talk about VARs, you kind of think, of, okay, a VAR is like the foam on your beer. It has to be there for a good quality product, but it's not doing a lot for you. Okay, <laughs> so it's a good way, when you hear VARs, it's that circulating current that keeps motors running. It's absolutely necessary there for motors. Uh, there's some new component utilization uh, using nanocrystalline cores for transformers has been developed, as has been uh, film capacitor, uh, central resonant link types of things for DC to DC uh, protection, also for safety. When you have a lot of DC things connected together, you actually need isolation. You can't just let them all reside on that bus. You need some kind of an isolation device, and that can be a DC to DC converter that does the job. Communications applications, uh, from sophisticated all the way down to wireless, all the way down to hardwired, uh, all been developed within Sieges. Uh, synchro phasers, where you measure the phase on the utility of, of the two sine waves. If that phase gets a little bit wacky, uh, you can contact the utility and say, we have an island situation. Do you want to keep running or you do not want to keep running? So it's a nice way, it's a new way to look at do you have an island and you don't have the false trips and so forth. <clears throat> Mesh networks are being used today already. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Just wanted to show you a low voltage ride through. On the left is a Sieges inverter that's providing the utility commanded ride through. If you look at the blue waveforms, that's the voltage. It goes all the way to zero here, it goes away, but the inverter continues to provide current to that utility on command from the utility. If you look at the curve on the right, if you just have a, a voltage dip, today that inverter is told to turn off. You see the red uh, magenta kind of things going away. That's required by the IEEE 1547 today, that when things get a little bit low on the voltage from the utility, the PV inverter has to drop offline. So it's gonna be, the utility's gonna have to say yes or no to stay on, and that can be either you know, if, if this is what we call legacy situation, uh, it's not the best situation today, or you can do a ride through and help the utility when it needs help. I talked about VAR support, I talked about ramping. Another thing you can do is when your PV power, PV system is producing a lot of power, but the utility can't take it, there's something called curtailment where you actually fold back. Uh, doesn't sound like the best economically thing to do, but if the utility says you've got to do that or you can't connect, it may be best economically. So there are some places in the U.S. Uh, where curtailment will likely be required on some of the weaker systems. Um, microgrid enablement is something that we all need to look at, and microgrids will be a big part of the smart grid in the future. Uh, and they'll be there basically as an uninterruptible power supply uh, to keep parts of that grid up and running uh, when the rest of the grid has problems. Economic optimizations was very important. Time of day metering is going to come along. Soon your electric bill will look like your phone bill with everything uh, logged to the nearest minute. <laughs> Hang in there, it really will happen. And that economic optimization uh, when you provide power to the grid, when you maybe put a little bit in energy storage, when you do uh, maintenance, uh, when you do uh, something like conservation in your home, turn the air conditioner up a little bit, all of those will be automatic functions. People aren't gonna wanna do it manually, so that will be automatic. It'll likely be part of a system. It might be part of an add-on, but all of this, uh, functionalities have been and are continuing to be developed. Uh, the photo here is a ramp, and that ramp can go at any speed, 
It's a commanded ramp by the utility that says, don't drop off instantly, drop off at this rate. Another area, we talked about energy storage with PV systems. Um, energy storage in this picture is where we have the battery uh, basically providing power to the grid. The grid comes back on. You have to charge the battery suddenly. It's like throwing your car in reverse on the freeway. You better have some synchronization so that everything takes place at the right time. Okay, the impacts. Uh, new system architectures really will increase the types and numbers of PV applications, and we're seeing a lot of calls from utilities uh, right along that very way. Uh, the utilities are saying, wow, you can provide bars for me, or wow, you can provide uh, data on what my distribution line looks like. Let's go for it, and we're seeing that. Um, utility dispatch will be something that a lot of utilities are going to want to have a little bit of control, especially on the big systems, not likely on the residential. And it may come along on commercial, uh, but right now the big systems are going to require uh, some utility dispatch. Um, communications definitely add economic value for the owner, provides advanced utility grid stability, and stability will be an issue of the future. New connection standards are being developed. What we have developed in Sieges with inverters that can we put in the laboratory, we can validate whether or not what's being written on, in those standards is something that can or cannot be done. And again, the system integration will definitely improve reliability and the functionality of total systems. Uh, and I see in the future the total system will be the PV system connected to the utility acting as a system. Quickly, I want to go through the four contractors. You can just jot the names down, go to their website. Um, you can see exactly what they have done. Uh, P uh, Petrosolar has developed microinverters. They are doing power on a pole, uh, installed by the utility, owned by the utility. They have over 100,000 installed already, uh, some with the Sieges features, some with earlier designs, uh, but the Sieges features are going to be something necessary for uh, Europe and other countries, so it's going to be a nice way to go. They're using a mesh network to communicate. Now the utility, in this case, knows what their distribution voltage looks like wherever these systems are installed. It's been a real plus. Princeton Power uh, talked about uh, nanocrystalline core, the 70 pound core replaces a 700 pound transformer. It's uh, pretty incredible, it's not ready for prime time, but they have developed and demonstrated it. They now have this uh, bank of, fi of film capacitors instead of electrolytics um, that have self-healing features and can basically report when one has gone bad, you don't have an explosion or anything like that. This is their developed inverter. It's a four-port demand response inverter. It basically has ports for energy storage, uh, for uh, commanded loads, for utility interconnection, and for photovoltaics or other resources. BV Powered uh, in Bend, Oregon. They are using the synchrophaser network along with Portland General Electric. That's gonna be demonstrated at the end of the month. Um, they have demonstrated it to us already. They have an advanced inverter controller interface, data collection, data analysis system that's all come out of the Sieges program. An important part of this is, I don't know if you know today, but inverters um, cannot be certified for how they handle the max power point tracking function. So this is a new protocol that could possibly be used inexpensively to get that max power point tracking uh, algorithm certified, and that would be a big help. Max power tracking can be uh, a bigger percentage of the losses than the losses of the inverter, the wiring, and so forth, if it isn't done right, especially on systems that have a lot of cloud movement. Uh, the concentrator systems are a little bit more difficult to track because they're very fast changes. Uh, so they have developed a max power point tracker algorithm and they have also put this protocol together that's going to go into an IEEE standard. 
They're going to demonstrate in uh, Portland uh, again in September. Uh, there's about uh, oh, 14 kilowatts or, or 14 megawatts worth of PV along the river there. Uh, they are on that feeder. They're going to actually do some synchrophaser type of measurements to show islanding. They're going to show all of the uh, sieges functionalities uh, on that feeder. Uh, all of these prototype basically conferences that we're having in September are going to be on real feeders. We're going to do everything that we can on that feeder that doesn't disrupt any customers and show the functionalities. Uh, CGIS, um, uh, FSEC SATCON will be demonstrating in Lakeland, Florida. They did a smart string combiner where you can look at the strings, do your max PowerPoint tracking, use a high vol higher voltage DC bus, and then they have a shared inverter configuration that can tie different types of generation uh, into you know, you know, PV, different types of technologies and so forth, all go into the same inverter and then feed into a grid. I'm not going to go through these in details. You know, we've done a lot in three years. We started at zero because there was no smart grid talk back then. Uh, but there's still a long ways to go. One of the longest, one of the things that we're seeing more and more is the need to go to 1,000 volts and possibly higher for the larger systems. There's a lot that needs to be done at the 1,000 volt level. It's not just an easy jump from 600 to 1,000 volts. Uh, longer sift in lifetime, we want to see inverters last as long as PV modules. So we're still looking at 30 years. Some people say it doesn't make sense, uh, but we're hearing more and more demands from the utility that we want utility-grade stuff out there. Optimize levelized cost of energy. Get the best you can, and we also want to add that value added where the value added means something to the customer. Energy management optimizations. Um, energy management isn't quite here yet, but it's going to come more likely in the form of an optimized energy management or energy storage. It won't be just a huge system. It's going to be something to get you by the big, you know, the big glitches that come along. And reliability, fire safety. I really want to talk about fire safety uh, because on roof type systems, there's a new National Electric Code requirement for arc fault detection. Uh, there's a couple of ways to get around the arcs. One might be a microinverter. Others will be detectors. Detectors might be in an inverter. They might be in string inverters. They might be clear back at the module. So there's a lot of things coming along. There have been fires. I know Neil Kanth wanted me to show a picture of a fire, but uh, I didn't want to do that. Sorry. Uh, you know, it's not a scare tactic. But there are fires. There's issues. There are systems that are shut down now because of, of fire within a utility system. We need to consider that. And our CGIS contractors have considered it, uh, and they are trying to implement what's there what they can today, but there's not really a lot out there. There's a couple things coming out uh, in the way of detectors, uh, but it's not there yet. So it's brand new, brand new territory. Communications, we're just beginning to scratch the surface. There will be all kinds of communications issues. There will be communications protocols. And when you get down to all of a sudden you're tied to utility and you're talking with utility, there's going to have to be security, and that security must be, you know, cybersecurity. There's no way to break in and, and tear the utility down uh, by hacking and so forth. So security will be a, as big a part of the system uh, communications as anything. A lot to go there. Uh, safety, I already talked about arc fault detection and mitigation, and there's going to be many methods coming along. Uh, the smart string combiners are going to be probably a good way to go for the large utility scale systems. And that's it. <laughs>